Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the API Equity Budget Press Conference. Um, thank you for being here today. It's hosted by the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. We're going to start in a, in a minute, but I just wanted to remind you that we will be taking questions at the end of the press conference. Um, and the way to do that, and I'll remind you at the at the end, um, the way to do uh, to ask a question is to use the raise a hand feature in the reactions um, panel down at the bottom of the Zoom. And um, and I'd like to kick it off to Dr. Richard Pan, who's state senator from the Sacramento area and also the chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. Thank you very much and good morning. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Richard Pan, California State Senator and Chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. We are here today to urge the governor to join us and make history. Yesterday, the legislature passed the historic API equity budget package, which funds 210 million over three years for programs to assist API communities across the state. The API equity budget packet is the first of its kind. It makes investments that responds to the surge of anti-API hate and violence and addresses historic inequities affecting the API community. It also directs funding that have affected the API community for over the past 220 years. The API community deserves this. And that is why over 150 leading API and ally organizations have come in support and we expect even more to continue to come on board. I want to give a special thank you to our community organizations, the Commission on Asian Pacific Islander Affairs, including their chair, Commissioner Karthik Ramakrishnan and Executive Director Goia Yang for helping us put together a community-centered budget package. I also want to thank Assembly Member Ting and my colleagues in the API Legislative Caucus for getting this proposal passed through its major hurdle into the legislative budget. And I also want to thank the leadership of both the State Senate and the State Assembly for prioritizing this again in the legislative budget, which we passed yesterday. I also must give a very special shout out to Andy Wong with Chinese for Affirmative Action for making today happen and for serving as our trusted messenger in the community. The API equity budget is about our community. So we are putting the community up front and in center at today's press event. Today, you'll hear from people who inspire not only myself, but everyone around them. We'll hear from Stop AAPI Hate, a group of not-for-profits whose data launched key discussions and critical changes needed to combat hate. We hear from community-based organizations who will give their perspective of what they are seeing on the ground and in our communities. Finally, we will hear from survivors of hate incidents and the need for the state of California to provide support and do more to help our community. And with that, I'm really pleased to introduce our first speaker, Manju Kaokina from Stop AAPI Hate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pan, um, and thank you to the API Legislative Caucus um, for your tremendous leadership now and over the years in supporting our communities. Um, I'm here today on behalf of the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council and Stop AAPI Hate. APCON, along with Chinese for Affirmative Action and San Francisco State University, last year in March of 2020, um, created the Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Center. Within just a few weeks, we received several hundred incident reports from across the country, and sadly, so many from California's uh, residents. Now, after the summer, fall, and winter months, we are at a point of receiving 6,600 incident reports, including 2,600 from those in California alone. That includes verbal harassment, civil rights violations like workplace discrimination, refusal of service in retail, uh, and being barred from transportation, and sadly, even physical attacks. These are only the tip of the iceberg. We know from AAPI data survey um, this past spring that over one in eight individuals in um, 
the U.S., that is Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, have experienced some form of hate or discrimination um, in 2020 and in 2021. And there are far-reaching impacts of this hate um, across our state. We've seen high levels of unemployment in the AAPI community, small business closures, significant impacts on the mental health and well-being, including those of our young people. And we also know there's been a historic lack of access to health care and to linguistically and culturally competent um, mental health care as well as physical health care. That's why it's so important that Governor Newsom take action now in supporting the Legislative Caucus's um, proposals and the budget that's been passed by um, the Assembly and the Senate. It's not simply about hate against our communities, but it's also about these impacts and the lack of investment over the years in our Asian American and Pacific Islander community members. And that's why bold and historic action must be taken now. Uh, as Senator Pan mentioned, it's $210 million over three years. That is less than 0.1% of the overall budget. So we need bold action by our governor now. We've been grateful for Governor Newsom's strong words of support over the past year, condemning the hate and racism against our communities. We've appreciated the meetings that he's held with community leaders and community members. And now we want to see results in the form of the enactment of this budget. We are in a critical time right now, and we absolutely need a budget that supports the our communities and our community members. So again, I wanna thank um, the API Legislative Caucus for the opportunity to share our work and again, for their leadership in supporting our communities. I wanna next introduce Stephanie Wynn, Executive Director of Asian Resources Inc., which we have an opportunity to work with here in Los Angeles um, to increase healthcare access. She's also the Vice Mayor of Elk Grove. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Manju. And, and thank you, Dr. Pan, for leading this and for the EPI Legislative Caucus and pulling this together. You know, I, I'm a daughter of refugee and immigrant parents who came here from Vietnam for a better future. And over 40 years later, I can tell you that I've experienced some type of anti-Asian violence, anti-Asian hate. But to me, that seemed normal. And that's not okay to say. That's not okay to say at all. And thank you to APCON for creating this Stop API platform for us to be able to report these incidents because there wasn't a way in an area in which we felt comfortable and safe in reporting these incidents. But because that was created, you now have over 6,000, over 6,000 incidents that have been reported. And we know that is an undercount. We know that because shortly after we held a press conference that Dr. Pan was at at our office, we received this anonymous four-page letter from a member who has said that he's been a, a victim of anti-Asian violence and he is fearful, fearful for his life. He is fearful to walk out of the streets. We know because I have a binder here full of incidents of folks who don't want to report it because they are fearful of retaliation. They are fearful that if they report it, something will happen to them or their family. That needs to stop. And we are urging the governor, we are urging the governor to take action now, as Manju said, because this will be the first of its kind. This will be history in the making. These incidents are attacking our most vulnerable, vulnerable communities. As an executive director that works directly with our immigrants, Asian community, I see this every single day. And I want to be able to say that I don't want to see it anymore. It needs to stop. It needs to stop. And the only way it'll stop is if you, Governor, will take action and invest in our communities. Invest in our communities so that the next generation, the young people will not be able to stand here and not say that this is normal to them, that they have been a part of some type of anti-Asian violence or anti-Asian hate. It needs to stop somewhere. And so we are urging you, Governor Gavin Newsom, to 
to accept this, to approve this, to move this forward so that our communities can feel safe. As an organization that works directly with these immigrant Asian population, I need to be able to feel safe and comfortable in letting them know that there is help for our community and there is an opportunity for us to move forward. And I can't say that and I can't do that unless this budget is approved. I'd like to now introduce um, our next speaker, Carl Chan, who is the president of Oakland Chinatown Chamber of Commerce and a survivor as an assault as well too. Thank you very much, Carl. Carl, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you for the reminder. Anyway, uh, thank you for the introduction, Stephanie. Uh, I really appreciate, you know, to seeing everyone here this morning, uh, especially uh, those who are in support, you know, of this uh, API equity budget. Uh, my name is Carl Chen. I'm the president of the Oakland Chinatown Chamber of Commerce. I'm also the chair for the APAPA uh, Greater Oakland Chapter, but also the uh, the former uh, chair and also current board member of the Asian Health Services. So many of you, you're realizing that we are facing a dual pandemic, uh, which the AAPI hates is the worst of it. But I want to say thank you to the media and the reporters. You are helping us to allow our voices to be heard, so which is so important. The Old and Chinatown Chamber of Commerce has been helping and supporting uh, many of us uh, suffering Chinatown businesses, their employees, the residents, especially our seniors, and of course the victims of crime. And uh, we're also helping, uh, working with the volunteers who are patrolling our Chinatown community. And what we are helping and what we want to do is to provide information and training and supporting, uh, you know, for all their needs. And recently, I myself became the victim of crime. And this hate crime, uh, of course, you know, uh, physically, but mentally uh, impacting myself, my family, and of course, the community. And uh, interesting enough, you know, the attack that happened recently, uh, I was actually on my way and helping the other victim of crime. Uh, but of course, after this attack, I myself understand much better and knowing how uh, these victims of uh, hate crime and their families are going through. But I wanna say this, we refuse to be the victims because we want to be the game changers. The Oakland Chinatown Chamber of Commerce, along with many you know, of these organizations, and we're working at the ground zero, supporting and providing much needed help, you know, for and the services and to giving the information uh, to many of those, those folks who need help. The seniors, the youths and definitely our employees who are afraid to even go to work in our community. Our businesses about to be closing down and many of our organizations, they are supporting you know, all these you know, hate crimes, but guess what? They are also suffering financial needs. And I just want people to understand, we are the taxpayers and who are supporting our economy and our beautiful state of California, whether in the good years or bad, Today, June 15, our governor is announcing that today is the opening of our economy. And uh, but guess what? Many of our AAPI businesses, we're not ready yet because we're still facing much, much problem with these hate crimes against our community. But I wanna say this, we're so thankful for our legislators, our state legislators who supported the API equity budget package. I do have a personal message to our governor. Governor Newsom, this is a do or die situation on behalf of our suffering AAPI businesses, the victims of crime and many of our organizations and those who care. We need your help to support the API equity budget package. We need your help now before it's too late. Thank you. And at this time, I really would like, like to uh, introduce, you know, this young lady. Her name is Millie, uh, Millie Liu, and she is a high school student. And she has so much want to tell you. Again, she is also not only a victim, she doesn't want to be a victim, she wants to be the game changer. So, Millie? 
Thank you, Mr. Chan, and thank you, API Legislative Caucus, once more for holding this space today. Hi, everyone. My name is Millie Liao. I'm a 16-year-old Chinese-American girl in her second year of high school at LA County High School for the Arts. I'm also the lead organizer of an entirely youth-led rally titled Youth Against Hate that happened just a few weeks ago in Grand Park in Los Angeles, where over 200 youth high school students just like me gathered together in an act to stop AAPI hate. I had the fortune of getting support from all my peers in ACLU SoCal's Youth Liberty Squad, as well as the youth organization 626 Speak Out. After this event, I went on to speak about my experiences at schools, museums, and even at an LAUSD press conference attended by Superintendent Austin Butner and school board members Monica Garcia, Nuck Melvoin, Scott Schmerelson, and Tanya Ortiz Franklin. I am so incredibly grateful for the attention and encouragement given because for the first time ever, we AAPI youth are beginning to feel like we're heard. But these strides did not eliminate the issue, and nor did I put together that rally thinking that it would. Long before the start of the COVID pandemic, anti-Asian hate and sentiment had already made its way into our classrooms. For me, it started before I can even remember. When I, when I first went to kindergarten, I didn't know how to speak English. And because of that, my fellow five-year-old classmates would shun me and refuse to play with me. And I would cry on the car ride home every night. My mom was crying when she told me the story, saying that she wished she could have given me a family that knew how to speak English and could teach me when I was younger. And then when I was in elementary school, the shape of my eyes were constantly mocked and my classmates made fun of my parents for their Chinese accents and broken English and would impersonate my mom at lunch. It's funny because this type of behavior was never called out, not by me, by my classmates, or even by my teacher. Bystanders turned a blind eye when even just one word could have helped so much. When I asked my middle school teacher if I could switch seats because the student kept calling me derogatory slurs, I was shut down because that would be too much work for her. My experiences are not unique. AAPI students across California and the US at large have gone through the exact same things that I have. The silence from all other parties when we face discrimination makes it feel normal, like we just have to toughen up and deal with it. But there's only so much we can take. We're still kids, we're still growing, and sometimes we get scared. And the worst part is we're scared because we can never change this part of us that people hate. And most of all, this year, we're scared to even go back to school. Every time we turn on the TV or go on social media, we see more of our people being harassed, beaten, and killed. And many of us are terrified of what will happen when schools reopen. For every single AAPI student who two faces each day with the burden of bat eater and slitty eyes, you will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. And to our legislators and especially Governor Newsom, you hold the power at this point. The first step towards a safer tomorrow for AAPI youth is providing support to them through their school. And this step can be taken if you support the API equity budget. This budget gives AAPI students a promise, a promise that even if they can't be safe anywhere else, they can be safe at school. Governor Newsom, you have given many words of support to the AAPI community throughout this period of rising anti-Asian violence and hate that were comforting to hear. But now we need you to act on those words. Us AAPI students need you to make this promise so that come fall, we know that there is still a place for us in schools to exist, to learn, and to grow. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Assembly Member David Chu for closing remarks. Thank you for that, Millie. And let me just start by thanking um, our API caucus chair, Dr. Pan, uh, who is leading a very united caucus uh, in solidarity with our community. I wanna thank our community leaders here today who are representing 150 organizations and the diaspora of our API community in our state. And I wanna thank Millie and Carl for being victims and survivors who are speaking out, who are telling your stories. You are representing thousands of our API brothers and sisters around California and reminding us why this proposal is so important. As the immediate past chair of the API caucus who helped to shape the earliest version of this budget proposal, I can share that this proposal captures what we have heard around the state from diverse API communities in a set of meaningful proposals to address the epidemic of hate that our communities have been confronting. As a San Franciscan, I saw firsthand the impact of 
violence on the lives of our constituents. Our city saw some of the earliest incidents of hate violence uh, in the first days when we got reports about COVID-19 before there was a single case diagnosed in the state of California we saw business drop to San Francisco's Chinatown by 50%. And this is what was experienced in API communities, not just in California, but around the country. Uh, when the Atlanta murders occurred, it was a wake-up call to the rest of the country. Uh, but for our API community, this has been a nightmare that we have been in for the better part of a year uh, that has come in part because of a former president that referred to the Chinese virus and Kung flu, in part on the heels of waves of history, dark history, um, echoing the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Japanese American internment, the persecution of Muslim Americans after 9-11. Now, let me just say, this is a budget proposal to fund a range of critical efforts, from data reporting on hate crimes, to culturally competent services for victims, to investments in incredibly important ethnic hubs our Chinatowns, our Japan towns, our Korea towns, our Little Manilas, um, that are key sources of support and belonging. This budget proposal will begin to address the needs not only of our API Californians, but of all diverse communities that continue to face racially charged acts of hate and discrimination across our state and across our country. And one thing I'll just note, it's important that we invest in the state, that we say as a state, we see you, we hear you, we can't just leave this work to grassroots organizations and CBOs within our organization to track and, and see the fallout of these incidents. We need to make sure that we have enough resources to really empower um, those who are serving our community and those who are leading our community. Um, and let me just close by saying, you know, we've heard today just two of thousands of stories uh, of incredibly disturbing and spiteful incidents, violent incidents that are real. The need for support of our community is real. We've got to do this today. And from my perspective, as someone who voted yesterday on a $267 billion budget, uh, we need to be able to dedicate $210 million over the next three years, essentially $70 million a year. We have to continue to be a leader when it comes to standing up for all of our communities, standing up against hate, standing up for justice, and standing up for safety. And with that, uh, again, appreciate all of you being part of this. I'm gonna turn it back over to Shannon. Thank you, everybody. Um, now I'd like to open it up for questions for reporters. Um, if you have a question of the panelists, um, either directed toward one of them or, or in general, if you could go down to the bottom of your screen, um, go to reactions, click on that and then use the raise your hand feature, um, then I can call on you and you can ask your, unmute yourself and ask your question. Just as a reminder, if you just go down to the bottom, um, click on reactions to use the raise your hand feature and then unmute yourself. I think all the questions, oh, we have one. Caroline, do you want to? Um, unmute yourself and hello. Hi there, we hear you. Okay, um, I just have a question for the panelists. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, how do you think? Again, like, obviously, um, you know, you've said already, like, you don't want to be like victims. You want to be game changers, like. But how do you think being a victim of like a hate incident or like hate crime yourself? How do you think that has impacted your kind of like? activism and how do you think it's kind of like if it wouldn't have happened do you think your efforts or like your measures would your approaches would be like different i'll jump in for a quick second on this and and say that i probably would not have become an elected official 
but for uh, a hate incident that occurred my freshman year in college uh, at a nearby university when there were eight Asian students heading to a dance that got attacked uh, in the dark of night by white football players who were not disciplined for that incident. And uh, there was a call that was put out to Asian students in that this is now going on over 30 years ago. Uh, I answered that call. And uh, uh, at the time, I was a pre-med student and uh, shortly thereafter started taking political science courses, decided to study the civil rights movement, uh, went to law school. And fast forward, I now serve as the first Asian American to represent Eastern San Francisco. Um, you know, I think our community has two responses to what's happening. We can uh, we can be passive, we can stand by doing nothing, or we can stand up and say, we've got to fight for our community, we have to protect our community, we have to defend our community, and we have to strengthen our community. And um, it's my hope that this is going to be an inflection point for our community where everybody wakes up, gets involved, uh, demands uh, what we what we need at this time, uh, and and ensure that we have a seat at the table. And it's my hope that you know Millie, who's in high school, that her generation uh, will 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 um, will learn from these experiences that that they need to stand up and they need to be represented and they need to count. And I have full faith that uh, for Millie and her peers, that will be the case. And uh, also, I just, and actually I would really, really love to hear from uh, both Millie and Carl, but I mean, uh, Millie's story really resonates with me because uh, when I grew up, uh, my parents were immigrants and I only spoke uh, Mandarin Chinese. And so when I showed up to school, uh, they essentially put me in, in the learning disabled class because I didn't speak English. And so um, I, I was one of the dumb kids, as they said, on the playground, right? And so, of course, uh, I, you know, I and my classmates who were in the essentially learning disabled class were, were bullied, I, me in particular, because I uh, didn't speak English uh, at the time. Uh, and so it's sad to hear that, um, I think, uh, uh, Millie, you're, you're, you're a lot younger than I am, that we still have, are sharing the same experience this many decades later. And that's why we need to pass this budget because this cannot keep going on for ever more decades. I don't want to see Millie, um, even though I know that she's going to do great things and maybe she'll also, also I, th I, I certainly hope she will have her opportunity to serve in the state Senate like I am, but then having to share a story with another 16 year old when she's my age about how, what happened, that that 16 year old also experienced the same thing. Then she can point to, well, I was at a press conference with a state Senator who's had the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm so I'm so excited. You know, when David and uh, Dr. Pan also sharing, you know, uh, your experience, um, and also Millie, and you know, uh, earlier I'm so happy Carolyn asked this question because um, and Jusha and also I'm sure uh, Stephanie, uh, many of us have gone through and understanding many victims of crime. Uh, they are still are very afraid to report uh, their own incidents, and they didn't even want to share their experience with anyone. And uh, I myself became the victim of crime. Of course, in a man view, have done it, uh, gone through it. And one thing we want people to do, the reason why I want, we want to call ourselves to be game changers, because we want to make sure that people would see something, say something, but most importantly, do something. Okay, so this doing part is so important. So together, what we would love to do, and especially for us, we want to make sure that to encourage those victims of crime and their families not to be afraid, but step in the front and tell not only tell their stories, but be part of you know um, the community saying that enough is enough. We want to do something about it. So that's about say something, see, see something, say something about doing something. But currently, my experience now with many victims of crime and the families, because they saw that I also was a victim recently. And I'm willing to step up and say, let's do something together. And guess what? That was actually encourage others to be supporting of what we do. And especially now that the victims are crying and now they feel that maybe time for them to also not to be afraid. So I'm hoping that by working together and especially uh, with this you know, API budget, and that will help us to support you know, many people in businesses, their employees, victims of crimes and the families. 
And I'm so excited to hear from what Lily has been sharing with everyone because we're looking into the future and which we are talking about the younger generation. So Dr. Penn, you're right. And, and, and David, you're right. So we want to encourage the younger generation to be doing more of this, you know, not only, you know, see something, say something about doing something. So we are counting on like Lily and the younger generation to, to do this and, and supporting our community. So I really appreciate for what you do, Millie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to really quickly say that um, I think I just want to echo what Dr. Pan said with um, how like in the future for future generations, the most important thing is education. And I want to say that bystander intervention is another thing that's super important. So what Carl said about, you know, doing something, I think that's what it really looks like um, to your question, Caroline, that like doing something looks like stepping in when you see something happening, doing something looks like even if you're not directly involved, helping uh, organize a rally or doing just doing anything, honestly, um, to make noise about it. And I think that it really, it's really about like bringing it back to the community, like offering resources for mental health, resources for lang like learning languages, because I know Dr. Van and I share that same experience. And sometimes I'd wish there would be someone, um, I mean, like someone in a school that could provide me with the resource to learn English. Um, and I know they do that now, but having more of that and having a better transition or a better program for that. Um, and I think those are things you can look towards with the budget. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open it up for any other questions. If anybody wants to raise their hand, use the raise a hand feature at the bottom. Okay, if there's no further questions, we're going to wrap up the press conference. Thank you very much for joining today. Mm -hmm.